everybody, and good evening. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. We've got a special discussion for you this evening. Uh, my name is Matthew Hughes. I'm the Executive Director of the International Relations Council in Kansas City, and we are so pleased to welcome you uh, to this month's uh, iteration of the International Film Club. Uh, how many of you joined this last month? I'm curious for, for our first film discussion. Great. Uh, we're really excited about this new series. You'll hear a little bit more about it later on. Um, but it's a really interesting and sort of different way of looking at what's going on around the world. Uh, just a couple housekeeping uh, pieces very quickly to get us started. Uh, we love having your cameras on. Thank you so much. If you would mute yourselves, um, and we can help you do that if, if you're not able to. Um, but that just helps us, helps the, the discussion to flow along. So thank you so much for that. Uh, for those of you who don't know the International Relations Council, uh, we are a Kansas City organization. We strengthen Kansas City's global perspective by maintaining an active dialogue around world events, global issues, and their impact on our community. Uh, as, an, as a nonpartisan educational nonprofit organization, the IRC values informed civil discourse, accessibility, and substance as we work to sharpen our community's 21st century global acumen. We have some additional digital programs coming up that may be of interest. Uh, next Thursday, August 6th, we have a news and views discussion on Ukraine. On Wednesday, August 12th, we will be joined by a professor from the University of Notre Dame for a conversation on Hong Kong and the future of promised autonomy. Uh, and I'm super excited. This is the first time we're publicly talking about it. Many of you got an email today about our new Choices Election Issues series. Uh, this is our new eight-week series in the weeks leading up to the presidential election in November. Uh, we're covering all sorts of topics, uh, diving in. We are a nonpartisan organization, but it, as an educational organization, it's very important that we help uh, the community understand the issues at play in the election. Uh, so take a look at irckc.org for more information about that program series. Um, while you're there, please do sign up for our weekly newsletter where you can hear about upcoming IRC programs and other international opportunities in Kansas City. Uh, this is a discussion this evening. Kevin will start us out, but we do invite you to jump in and, and share your thoughts and reactions. Um, you know, the arts and particularly film have a special ability to transport us to other places, times, and realities and give us insight into the ways and the whys of the world. Uh, the IRC's International Film Club helps us to explore international realities and global issues using films of the world and about the world. Uh, next month, so you know, we, we are looking at the Oscar award-winning film Parasite, uh, which is a personal favorite of mine. So I hope that you'll join us for that. It'll be the last Tuesday of August. Um, but this evening, we are in for a special treat and we are very honored uh, to be joined for this evening's discussion of the 2020 film To Five Bloods by one of the film's screenwriters who happens to be a Kansas native. Uh, many of you will know Kevin Wilmot. He grew up in Junction City. Uh, he has spent a lot of time in and around Kansas, uh, and he is now a professor at the University of Kansas uh, in film. Uh, he has had a tremendous career as a screenwriter, including being an honored for his work on the 2018 film Black Klansman with an Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay. Kevin, thank you so much for being with us this evening, and the floor is yours. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it, man. Well, uh, with the Five Bloods um, uh, setting it up, um, when when we won the Oscar that night uh, for Black Klansman, um, we had already written uh, the Five Bloods. It was a it was a rewrite. There were two two uh, other writers before us that originated the script. Um, uh, Paul, uh, Paul and, uh, and Matt, and, uh, and, and they did a really great job. I mean, it was, it, you know, it's, it's a really, um, you know, it was a rich, it started really as a, a very strong script. And, uh, you know, the, the joke that uh, I always uh, give about a rewrite was really that we kind of blackified it, really. And, you know, we really made it a black film uh, about the black Vietnam experience. Uh, and, and I think when, when we were approached, when Spike and I were approached with the, the script and the project, I think we immediately saw it as the opportunity to tell uh, the black Vietnam story. Um, you know, most Vietnam films that we've seen and, and, and a lot of great ones, 
uh, had more characters in them, but you know, never really from the black point of view, from the black soldier point of view. And so we saw this as an opportunity to, to really kind of do that. And uh, the fact that it was, um, you know, that it was about the search for gold, the buried treasure, and, and that, that these guys were, you know, older and going back, you know, some 30 years, 40 years later to uh, find their lost comrade and, and the goal, you know, gave, gave it, you know, gave us the opportunity to make it really contemporary. And so that, I think that's uh, a thing that Spike uh, is always really interested in. I think I'm always interested in that as well. Um, that, Contemporary link really gives it uh, gives you the opportunity to deal with a lot of to really make the past present. You know, but that's that's really I think what what that, why that's so important. Um, and and it just it just makes it makes Vietnam more of a living thing now. And and uh, instead of looking back on it, it's it you try to make it feel like it's. The war is still going on in a sense, and in a lot of ways, the war is still going on. I mean, it, it you know, one of the things about war is it kind of never dies. It just kind of, it just kind of keeps going, in, in all these various forms, and so, uh, and we tried to lace that into the script in various ways. Um, that whole message about how war never really ends, um, uh, but. Uh, it was a. It, it wasn't a difficult rewrite. I think the the, the thing that uh, we really brought to the to the script was uh, flashbacks, uh, and uh, really the whole third act really was th completely different than the original script that we saw. Um, uh, you know, we we really you know delved into a couple of characters a lot more, uh, specifically probably Paul's character. Um, and, uh, and he was, he was written pretty much that way to start with, but we just kind of took him to the next, the next level, uh, you know, made him a Trump, a Trump supporter, uh, made him, um, and he was really kind of already written that way because he was, this is before Trump was on the scene when the, when the, the other writers had written the script, but, um, but he was a racist, you know, not a, not a horrible racist, but but definitely a racist, and uh, and so when, when making him black, um, you know we wanted to keep those same traits that that he had in the in the original script, and and so uh, making him a Trump supporter just kind of opened up a whole new kind of avenue for us to talk about things going on today, and, and for symbolism and for the things that just made it a lot more contemporary. Um, and, but at the same time, connecting to the past with, with Vietnam and, and with war and with all of the things that Vietnam is shaped by. Um, uh, you know, one of the things we really tried to do was to, um, to really, you know, you know, avoid the stereotypes of, of the Vietnam movie. Uh, you know, we tried to treat the Vietnam characters, the Vietnamese characters, uh, a lot different than you see often in war films. I actually teach a class on anti-war film, and one of the things that, um, you know, that war movies that are, I guess you'd say pro-war movies, is that they make the enemy kind of faceless and, and, and um, a thing. And, and so we tried to avoid that in the film. And, uh, so we did different things to try to make all the characters human, even though, you know, there's a Vietnamese gang in the film and, they, and that's kind of symbolic of, of, um, of really the war in that sense. Uh, and we, try, we try to make those, those characters uh, three dimensional. Um, and so as a whole, it was, you know, it was a great experience. I, I, I got to uh, go over to Thailand. It was shot mainly in Thailand, a little bit in actual Vietnam. Um, I got to go there for about a week, and it was, it was really great. Um, uh, you know, I, you know that, it was a quite, a, a quite a big film in terms of, I think it took about three months to shoot. Um, 
obviously, you know, when you go to a foreign country and, and you're bringing a bunch of people, it's quite, it's quite an endeavor. And, um, but, but, you know, I, I don't think there were any huge problems on the, on the film. Um, I think a lot of it was the fact that, you know, Spike's really great at, at casting and, and really, you know, casting is one of the big elements of being a good director, you know, um, if you great if you got the right cast you and and they're good strong sane people <laughs> you know you're gonna have you're gonna probably make a great film uh and uh and, and clearly there's some you know delroy and and um clark peters i mean there's a lot of really great performances in the film so um maybe i can open up for questions now Yeah, if, if folks have questions, feel free to jump in. Um, Kevin, I'll, I'll maybe uh, pitch one out to you to get us started. Sure. Um, you know, one of the one of the the most striking pieces for me at right at the beginning uh, was the the lengthy discussion of, of black soldiers in U.S. wars, uh, which I think is a story that has not been uh, told or or at least heard. Uh, by by the majority of Americans, and I think that a lot of people are not aware. Um, and and one of the there was a, a figure uh, that was given at one point, uh, I think by uh, by a Vietnamese person about uh, the the proportionality of and and it was something like uh, eleven percent of the U.S. population uh, was black, but thirty plus percent of the soldiers in Vietnam uh, were black. Could you just comment on that a little bit? That was really striking. Sure, yeah. Well, Vietnam was a, a, a really unjust war on so many levels. And uh, one of the big levels was that poor folks fought the war. I mean, poor whites fought the war, poor blacks fought the war. You know, poor people fought that war. And, and poor people were the people who could not avoid the draft. And, and, and they just drafted people in, in, in huge numbers. Uh, uh, and young, young men, uh, specifically who couldn't, you know, at that time, people may not know this, but at that time, if you went to college, you could avoid the draft. So if that's what made it a really a poor people's war is that the people who could not afford to go to college, and that was a, a lot of folks, I mean, it was, you know, it was very different than about, you know, grants and, and loans and all of that stuff. I and mean, people didn't even know how to do things like that back then. Uh, so the ghettos uh, and the the, the 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 rural areas, and and it was those areas that really, you know, they harvested the soldiers from. And the early the early uh, stages of Vietnam specifically were just, you know, a lot of young people died, and they, you know, Americans had not figured out how to fight the war yet, and they had there was just a, almost like cannon fodder. There was so many people that died early on. And um, uh, which led eventually to people turning against the war, um, and and seeing how unfair it was that that you know if if you were from, from an affluent family and you stayed in school or or if you could get somebody to lie for you or if you had connections you could get you could get you could get out of service, and uh, and poor people don't have those connections, and so. Um, you know, people lied about bone spurs, and they lied about, you know, they lied about different ailments to uh, to avoid service, and so it became really a poor people's war. And uh, you know, and what's ironic about one of the things we try to say in the film is that it's a it's a war. These black soldiers have always fought in wars, even still today, to some degree. I would argue have always fun in wars with the idea that, uh, you know, I will serve, I will, you will see my sacrifice, you will see my loyalty and my, uh, and my belief in, in America, and in turn, you will give me my full citizenship and my full rights, my full civil rights. And that was that from the very beginning in the Revolutionary War, uh, being the Revolutionary War, you know, the British were saying, you know, if you don't want to be a slave, come fight for us and we'll, we'll free you. And, you know, Christmas Addicts, who's the first, you know, person to really die in the Revolutionary War in America is a, is a newly freed slave. And uh, so, you know, from the very beginning of the country, that has been, 
that has been the role of the black soldier has been tr trying to really prove his manhood, prove his loyalty in the hopes that, that things will, will, you know, will get better at home. I, I, I appreciate that very much. Evan, I'm realizing, and if people don't know, Evan is our program coordinator at the IRC, does a fabulous job with us. Um, Evan, could you help me to monitor, uh, if people can use the participant uh, window, have you all done this before? There's a raise hand feature and I think that might be the best way for us to do it. So down the bottom of your screen, it'll say participants, and you, you'll, see, um, you'll see raise hand in there. And if you have a question or a comment that you'd like to make, that might be the best way to do it. And then, um, oh, and I can see those too, that's great. So we'll, we'll get you in here in just a second. Um, Giselle, would you like to go first? Uh, Giselle, it's nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I can only stay a short time because I have another another webinar at 7.30, but um, this was great just to hear a little bit about the film. Kevin, hi. I really hey, enjoyed so. um, Thank you. Good to see you. The film. Um, and I was wondering, um, did, did you um, use any literature, so short stories or um, novels or historical materials as um, inspiration for the film, or did you rely mainly on your um, on kind of interviews with folks or your memories of the era? I'm just wondering how much of that came into the building of the Yeah, um, uh, mainly, mainly memory of the era. And um, uh, the book Bloods, uh, we did refer to some. Uh, that was kind of our, our, um, our one real great source for the Black soldiers' experience in Vietnam and a one-stop shopping kind of, kind of book. Um, uh, but as a whole, um, you know, I think mainly probably because it was a rewrite. And so there were, there were things there that, that Spike and I saw and it kind of immediately kind of went like, we can take this and use it this way. So we kind of came to the film kind of with our own agenda. So then, you know, resources, source material, research kind of material, was always kind of very targeted in that sense. It was like, so we need to know more about this. We need to know more about that fact. We need to more, know more about this. Like, things like um, Hanoi Hannah, uh, you know, who's a character in the film. And, uh, and she, uh, you know, we looked up things that she actually sent up to black soldiers and, and, and what, what kind of propaganda was used by the Vietnamese army to, to really kind of directly go at black soldiers. So we found that, that type of material and, uh, and used that in the film. Great. Giselle, thank you so much. How about Steven? Um, first off, thanks. Um, thank you for this. And I was actually originally about to ask you if you filmed in Thailand because I actually recognized that um, floating market. And then, so you kind of confirmed that. But I was also wondering about the, if it was deliberate, the fact that, you know, the Vietnamese gang member, how he was accosting, um, um, accosting the Five Bloods about their, about um, the role about William Cali, Cali and the My Lai Massacre. Yes. Oh. Yet later on, he is working under a white French, a Frenchman. Yeah. And if, and so for all of his like indignation about how there are these American, G old American GIs there, he's actually working against the original col uh, colonist. Yeah, no, it's great you picked that up. Uh, you know, we, um, uh, I think just, we're always looking for irony in all of it. Um, the black soldiers have a great deal of irony too. I mean, they, uh, for all the, the belief they have in, um, you know, trying to be, you know, free black men and, and kind of understanding the flaws of the system, they fall into the trappings of the system as well. And, 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 and they and, and end up kind of paying the price for that. And that's kind of one of the big themes of the movie is, um, you know, that Storm and Norman was telling us, was warning us uh, about, about money and about, you know, capitalism and about all those things that can, can make you kind of turn against each other. And, uh, and, I, and I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, Quan in the film, it kind of does that same thing. You know, he, he, you know, the greed and all of that ends up making you kind of team up with people that are ultimately kind of your former oppressors, even your current oppressors in some ways. 
thank you. Uh, Erica Maurer, I see you on the call. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Professor Wilmot. Um, I'm Erica Maurer from Avila University. And I just wanted to uh, first say that the film was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Um, and one question that I had was, um, well, first, I really appreciated your acknowledgement of um, the children that um, were the product of relationships um, between Vietnamese women and American GIs. And I was curious to know if that was part of the original screenplay, if that was your own edition, and what uh, you used to inform the writing of, of that storyline. Sure, sure. That was that was originally part of the of the of the uh, written was a part of the original screenplay, uh, but um, I think Spike and I both immediately gravitated toward that storyline. Uh, I grew up in a little small town called Junction City, Kansas, and Junction City is adjacent to Fort Riley, Kansas, where the Big Red One is, and that's we use the Big Red One in the film as the uh, as the infantry division that the Bloods are part of, and as a kid, I grew up really in my neighborhood were a lot of black and Vietnamese kids. And, uh, you know, because of the, of the army being in, Fort, in, 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 you know, in Fort Riley in Junction City, you know, it, it was incredibly integrated, incredibly diverse, multiracial kind of world I grew up in. And, uh, and black, black and Chinese, black, black and Korean, uh, black and Japanese, uh, black and Vietnamese. Uh, in fact, the, you know, the Michon character is named after a girl I went to school with. And uh, so, and I, you know, I got to see growing up um, the Bloods and, and the Dap Handshakes and the brotherhood and camaraderie that black soldiers had with one another. And all of that had a huge influence on me growing up. And those are really etched memories that I have about that whole period. And you know, I went to the movies with black soldiers and I went to see, you know, the Green Berets with John Wayne with, with, with soldiers. And I could tell when I saw that film with soldiers, how they felt about it. And there were no black soldiers in the movie theater, but they were all white soldiers and they felt very different about it than when I saw Superfly with a, with, a, with a theater full of black soldiers who, who just come from Vietnam and, and going to Vietnam. And it was, a, it was one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had in a movie theater. And, uh, and so, it, I mean, those things just kind of taught you kind of what the attitudes were. I had, I had a cousin that I spent some time with as a kid who went to Vietnam and, and came back from Vietnam. And I got to see how it altered him and changed him. But, um, uh, but you know, we, you know, we did some research as well on on what it was like to be a black Vietnamese, um, uh, you know, kid after the war. I mean, they really suffered after the war after the Americans left, um, and so we try to put as much of that into the film as possible. And and you know, you know, I've, I've had I have friends that I have a friend that uh, her father. Uh, had a child in Vietnam and, uh, and, and reconnected with them with him years and years later, just like it is in the film. And so that, all those storylines are, are very real. And uh, and uh, you know, I just feel fortunate that I, I was kind of grew up seeing that stuff and, and had a had a basic understanding of it. Thank you so much. I I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I, I think one of the themes that we're pointing to is how layered this film is. There are just so many, uh, not just layers, but paradigm shifts, I think. And, and Michelle Arthington, I don't know if you'd like to uh, turn on your microphone. You have a, a great comment in the chat box here. Oh, I'm not, I'm not sure if we can hear you, actually. I'm sorry about that. Okay, can you hear oh, we me got, now? We got you now, yep. So I was in Vietnam a few years ago, and the people are so welcoming to American tourists. And it really was a culture shock. You know, I'd been in other countries in Asia, but just to hear the war called the American War, to go to the Coochie Tunnels, to see um, propaganda um, from that time, I mean, it just really was a paradigm shift for me. And I had brought my teenage son at the time. And I think you really 
um, were, were true to that in the film, and I appreciated the way that the Vietnamese actors were portrayed as well. So it was it was great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the things that Spike does a really great job of is uh, when when you go to the world of the film, um, uh, you really try to embrace that world, and you and you go there not acting like you know. You go there with with you know wanting really the 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 people of that of that world the people of the world of the film to really inform the, the movie really inform the story and really inform your directing and all of that and and uh and spike does a really good great job of that and, and i think uh because there were things that you know terms like the american war and those kind of things those are those are like you said those things come specific from from the point of view of the Vietnamese, and and that's the way they talk about the war, and uh, we've had such a huge impact on on their lives, probably forever in that country, uh, that um, you know you just you just you know it, it 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 really lets you know you know how much of a of a mark we will probably have always leave on on that country and and, that, and those people. Great, Michelle, thank you. Uh, Peter Gorovich, I see your hand raised. Oh, and I think you might be on mute. Sorry, it took me a second to get my scroller to get over there. We got you. Uh, Kevin, uh, so uh, this is Tamara Falikoff's mother. This is Celia Falikoff. Hey, how you doing? Good to meet you. <laughs> That's the only reason I'm on here. At <laughs> <laughs> we chatted with Kevin a little bit before you all came on, and we thought this movie is just brilliant, 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 brilliant. And we think it deserves the millions of Academy Awards. It's probably not likely to get, but we thought it was fantastic. And oh, um, we, there we are so many, there are so, as, as Matthew said, there's so many layers to talk about. I mean, one, Michelle, when I was in Vietnam about 15 years ago, I was overwhelmed with the friendliness towards Americans. It just takes your breath away. It's it's stunning, and they can talk about the American War, and you go to the museums that show the damage and the poisoning and the suffering and all that. At the same time, they're extraordinarily friendly to you. But so that's an amazing thing, uh, Kevin. The question I wanted to ask had to do with the role of the French, the, the French subplot theme, and I was wondering if you could say more about that. So I wonder how much of it was in the original script, how much you developed, because I thought it's brilliant. The role it plays is really quite brilliant because it's a it's a foil for the preceding colonization, as you said, and they are used to make commentary on the Americans. They're the other Europeans yes. who comment who comment on the perfidious, terrible role of the Americans. You know, we did the same thing. You so snobby to us. So you can have them make the comment about how snotty the Americans are, rather than have the African American guys have to say that, they can say it. And so right. it's, yeah. it's brilliant. But I was wondering the woman, the young woman. She yes. talked about her hyper-rich parents. She's obviously guilt-ridden. Yes. Where's that character come from? Could you comment on that? How much was that sure. there? How you developed it? Where does she come from? That that idea of her, she plays an incredible role in, in the whole thing, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, her character was originally in, in the original script, but, um, but we wanted to bring her out a lot more. Uh, and uh, with the with our version, spoken my, my version, and so uh, really went specifically into what you described. I mean, we we wanted her to really bring out the French storyline and uh, the colonial, you know, the colonial storyline and and how you know how the Vietnam War really started and and why it started and all of that. And so um, we you know we made her. Uh, or, or, you know, kind of, we based her on kind of the Michelin, like she was a Michelin, uh, <laughs> you know, Michelin tire girl. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's kind of unspoken, but that was who I based it in. And I looked up the Michelin company specifically. And, uh, and they talked about white gold. I mean, they, they started with, they made their money early with, with, with rice, you know, and that's called white gold there. And so the white gold element of it, I thought was really interesting because it, turned, it tied into our gold notion too with our, the gold in our film as well. And, uh, and then they moved into tires and he moved into rubber and all of that and then made a, a kajillion dollars. And, and of course exploited the Vietnamese people horribly and in the process. And, uh, 
Uh, and of course, it was one of the main reasons why there's a war because, you know, you, you know, people get tired of being ripped off at some point and they, and they fight back and, and then you have a, you have a war. And, and I mean, that's the part of, of how these wars start that we never talk nearly enough about is that the, the money factor that's always a, a big part of it and, and why colonialism is there in the first place because somebody's probably getting rich off of it. And, uh, and then, then the government comes and supports them and then you're in a war. So, uh, so that was, that was, that was, that was where all of that originated from. Thank you very much. Uh, Tamara Felikoff, I would love to bring you in. Uh, you've got a, a great insight here about the generational differences that come out in the film. Well, first of all, let me say thanks to Matthew and Evan for organizing this. Um, Kevin is a beloved colleague. I just also love the film. I'm thrilled that so many people are here. Um, I was interested in the generational difference, just a little anecdote about my, my honeymoon. Um, my husband and I decided to go to Vietnam, actually, and so we met some interesting people. Two little anecdotes that relate to the film. One, uh, we met a man in Las Vegas prior to, or no, after our honeymoon, and he asked us, he was trying to do a timeshare little spiel to us so we'd get a free show, because we're like that, we're those kind of people. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes, okay, so timeshare, where did you guys go for your honeymoon? Tell me. And we're like, well, actually Vietnam. And he goes, Vietnam? You went to Vietnam? That is a scary place. Why on earth did you go to Vietnam? And we're these young 20-somethings like, what's the matter? Vietnam, it's cool. And so I was just thinking like maybe the son had a different perspective than the dad about Vietnam. I mean, there's clearly a lot going on with that character. So I wondered if you could talk about that. And then before you do, Kevin, I just want to share an anecdote that I learned from uh, a, a wonderful Vietnamese guide that um, showed us around who said, you know, the reason why people are nice to Americans is because for us, you guys are a blip in our history. Listen, we were invaded by the Chinese for a thousand years. We were invaded by the for 100 years, you guys, 10 years, you're a blip. Wow. So I thought that put things in perspective of, you know, we have all this regret about it. We have a very different long view of history that we do not. Wow. So anyway, um, please, Kevin, we, I don't want to keep saying Amer Americans could learn from that, that long view of history there a little bit. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, um, uh, that I think, uh, Paul's son, um, in the film, um, you know, I, I, you know, I think it's kind of, in, it's kind of a given, I mean, we don't really say it, but I think it's implied that, that, uh, he, he, you know, he's not thought about Vietnam at all for the most part. I, don't think. I mean, he's, he's probably heard his, some stories from his father, but he does, I don't think he comes to Vietnam with preconceived notions about the war, the war, I mean, about the country at all. I mean, you know, that's the thing about, about movies that uh, I think are important because there's a whole generation of, of young people there that don't know anything about Vietnam. I mean, they know nothing about it. They know that we were there, but that's basically, yeah, they don't know how the war was fought or why the war was fought or, I mean, you know, they, they, you know people don't, they're not taught history uh, very much in school, and I don't think, and especially, I mean, something like Vietnam that has such a deep, complicated history, um, you know, they, they're not getting that lesson, and so I think he's, he's like that, I mean, he's a, he's a school teacher, so he knows probably more than, than, than average folks, uh, uh, but I think he comes to, to the, to the war, to that, to, uh, the situation with his dad, more on about just concern for his father, and, uh, my dad's been acting crazy and he's, you know, he's, you know, and, and, and now he knows about the gold and all of that. And so he gets caught up in the adventure of it. But, um, uh, but, you know, the, the Michon character is kind of another example of that too. I think, mean, you know, she's, she, you know, like you talk about generations. I mean, she knows certain things, but there's a lot of things she doesn't know. And, so the, the, the things that she doesn't know, 
Uh, I, the, maybe the difference there is she's really probably hungry for that knowledge where, um, because it's kind of been held, held for her. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, Jim Turner, I see your hand raised. Thank you. Um, I, my question comes, I suppose, from outside the frame of the uh, movie, but, but uh, it does occur to me that uh, the Black Americans fighting the war have some overlap of um, impacts with the people who are colonized, the, the nations that are colonized, the yeah. societies that are colonized. And um, I'm always thinking from the environmental side of things, and I'm thinking that climate change is going to be wrecking some of these um, living conditions for the colonized, historically colonized areas a lot more, even more than it will for us industrialized nations. And uh, I don't know if that's something you can uh, uh, make any comment about, but that, that's a thought that I have. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, yeah, going off what you're saying there, I think you're, I think you, you, you're, you're dead right. Um, you know, one of the things we try to emphasize a little bit in the film is the, uh, is the Agent Orange uh, element of, of, of the war and about how um, herbicide and poisons and there was a, a tremendous amount of destruction to the environment in the Vietnam War. I mean, permanent, you know, destruction in terms of we really, you know, we're using cancer as a, as a weapon in a way. And, you know, probably without our knowledge for the most part, but, but nevertheless, it was, we used it and um, destroying our own troops and then obviously destroying a lot of lives there. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of symbolic in terms of what you're talking about, how, uh, you know, colonialism, because it's, it's always kind of geared in, um, uh, you know, oppression and, um, and, and, and really just kind of, uh, you know, the word I'm looking for, just really kind of ripping, ripping anything off they can really. Um, because it's because it's 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 based in that it's that's the very nature is about like stealing and robbing and um, and they literally kind of rob the environment as well and and that and that and that that stealing the environment and robbing the environment destroying the environment uh, for their own ends is um, uh, real you know I'm sh the country there is still suffering from that and and Americans Americans here are still suffering from that as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Rebecca, please. So I was wondering if you made, when you made that, was it a conscious decision to kind of bookend it with Ali at the beginning and Martin Luther King at the end with the Langston Hughes? And was that your decision? Because you said you changed a lot in the third act, right? So was that your? Sure. Well, um, you know, we, you know, Spike, kind of right he kind of uh it's not even really written uh, the, the opening um kind of credit sequence the opening sequence to where the documentary footage is used um uh that's you know that he didn't we didn't really know exactly what we were going to do and then it was really left to um the, the him in the editing room really uh you know that, that I, I knew he would probably do something that set up the world, the problem of, Viet, of Vietnam, the Vietnam War, and um, and because it's you know it's our movie is really about the black soldiers' experience, um, you know the Ali stuff and all of that really kind of takes you there and it, it really gives you that that, um, uh, that whole point of view that 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 you know this is where where black minds this is where black people were thinking at the time and uh and you know there was a lot of there was a lot of you know complicated feelings in the black community about the war as well i mean you know one of the best examples is dr king when dr king comes out against the war um you know he's horribly criticized from from jackie robinson and the naacp comes out against him and he's uh, you know and so so he's siding with muhammad ali and uh, muhammad ali you know, is is not totally, you know, his point of view is not totally accepted even within the black community to a large degree. Mm -hmm. and so, 
uh, that was a really complicated time, and the war just divided everything up in so many different ways. Uh, and then the 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 end the end quote with Dr. King, I think Spike kind of came to that seeing kind of how um, you know that 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 the the war in Vietnam probably got Dr. King killed. Yeah. And that and what I mean by that is that. When he when he came out against the war, he lost some of the allies and some of the, the real support that that he had, and, and and without getting into a bunch of conspiratorial crap, right. uh, what I mean is that he he was really vulnerable during that, that period where he was assassinated, and 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 that vulnerability was really created by him coming out against the war. Mm -hmm. And I think the two of them lost a lot because of their stance. No, no doubt about it. I mean, yeah. because, you know, people were telling King to just stick with civil rights. Don't get into right. the war thing because, yeah. you know, and, and, and Muhammad Ali is like, you know, you're the champ. You should, you know, you have years. You have not fought. You're, you're, you're losing your prime here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More, than, more than likely, it cost uh, Muhammad Ali his health because he probably fought longer than he should have and, yeah. and, and, and created damage because he fought longer than maybe he would have if he had been able to fight those years that he was sidelined. Thank you. Evan, would you like to jump in with a question real quick? Yeah, I, I, I would. Um, <clears throat> being a, uh, a huge jazz fan myself, I was, of course, um, delighted to, uh, to see Terrence Blanchard, uh, you know, produced the score, particularly after the fantastic one for Black Klansman. And I hope he's um, properly honored um, for, for this score as well. And I, I was curious about um, if you could speak to his work on the score and that working relationship um, between him and Spike and, you know, just the development of, of that, because I think it's just fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's, he's worked with uh, Terrence for you know, a long time. And um, and I think that what Spike tends to do, at least you know, this is what I've seen him do. This is my kind of relationship with him, and and I think Terrence has the similar kind of relationship. Is that um, uh, he kind of tells you what he wants, he's kind of tells you what he's interested in, and, and then he kind of lets you do your thing. Uh, and and that's that's I think what what he does with with Terrence. I mean, you know, he kind of creates a he creates a creative shorthand with you. I mean, we're all about the same age. I think Terrence is a little younger than, than Spike and I. Uh, but, um, but, you know, we all kind of share the same uh, influences and the same kind of point of view and all of that stuff. So, you know, there's not a lot of discussion that happens, really. You know, we, we, we you know, we'll, we'll kind of talk about what it is. And then, and, uh, you know, he'll, you know, Terrence, I think just goes off and does it and then plays it for Spike and Spike may have some adjustments or some additional things, but as a whole, I think, um, you know, he knows kind of what Terrence is going to do and, and, and Terrence delivers. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one of the themes that we're seeing in the, in the chat box right now is about this ongoing nature of war, even after war finishes. And Chris, would you like to make your comment about the landmines? Sure. Can you hear me? Um, hey, Chris. Hey. So I grew up north of you a little ways yes. ago, 15 miles or something like that. And I was just coming of age. I was early in high school when they decided to expand Fort Riley, supposedly to shoot bigger guns, which I think never actually happened. And it wiped out our farm, 300 farm families. So that was all happening in my middle high school years. And then I ended up in LA a few years later with all the anti-war stuff. And believe me, that prologue with inner city blues and <laughs> it's <just> like, ah, <laughs> very uh, emotional. And of course the, the Valkyries riding up the- <laughs> Yeah, the river, yes. All of the music, just the only, the only musical thing that I was cur curious about and that's outside of your jurisdiction, but I was actually surprised that there was sort of a glory treatment on the early flashbacks as opposed to a grittier, uh, you know, that surprised me. But at any rate, you know, it's, all, it's always very interesting. But my question had to do with just personalizing um, 
I have wanted to go back to the farm. And I know some people in my high school have actually done that. The farm, all the buildings and everything are gone. So it's kind of like the way the pioneers would have seen it probably when they yeah. approached. Uh, but one of the things I haven't really started researching this that I thought about is, gosh, would there be buried munitions lying around? Um, and I know some people have gone back and they say it's really hard to, to, to it's really easy to get lost because all, a lot of the th uh, things that you would rely on are, are missing. But that just made me wonder, uh, because that landmine scene was very effective. <laughs> Money is the root of all evil, kapow. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good one. Um, yeah. What yeah. is, you know, what is the situation with landmines in Vietnam and probably more, more pertinently the Cambodia and other places? I mean, is sure. it relatively cleaned up or is it still a problem? It's, a, it's still an ongoing problem, and um, it's, there's landmines, there are uh, unexploded you know, bombs that were dropped from, from, from the airplanes. Um, I mean, there's just so much, you know, tonnage of bombs were, were dropped on the country, and mines and other kind of anti-personnel weapons and stuff that, you know, kids just, people farming, kids, will step on something and, and they still, so all of that, of that whole organization that is, uh, that we use in the film is based on a real organization that does that work. I mean, that's all, all very authentic kind of work that's still being done in not just in Vietnam, but in any place that's had war. And, and, and Vietnam just, you know, has a lot of, a lot of stuff that in the jungle that you just can't find until you find it. And, um, and you know they're still cleaning out areas, and they're going back and cleaning out areas, and so it's a, definitely an ongoing thing. You know that that part, Chris, where you were talking about um, uh, what they did to the farmland. Uh, that's called soldiers would call that going out in the, to the field, and 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 in Junction City, when they would let those those weapons would be discharged, it would shake our house at at, at back home, and 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 you know. And when I would talk to soldiers, uh, they would say, yeah, we have to go out into the field. And that, so that, that whole area that, that you're talking about, those old farms, that was what was called the field. And, and they would just go out there and they would do war games and, and you know, set up big cannons and all of that stuff. And, and so who, I, I, I would think they cleaned that stuff up when they were finished, but, but, but who knows, you know, I mean, uh, it's it was their it was their world and and uh, you know but they every every few months they would go out into the field and and do that stuff and uh, so uh, but yeah that 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 uh, the mine situation all of that still an ongoing ongoing and I the young people that you see near the end of the film that have lost limbs all of those are kids that have unfortunately been the victims of. Uh, those uh, uncharged, un undischarged uh, munitions. Yeah. yeah, my son is um, was is with the UN uh, now in Armenia, but he was in Lebanon for a while, and uh, took some trips out with people that um, do the land and mine removal. And he said it was really scary. <laughs> it's very very scary. Yes. Yeah, not something I want to experience. And uh, Sue Ann had a comment, and Sue Ann, if you want to hop on about the, the boat scene with all the merchants uh, and have, how war sort of lives right under the surface. Sue Ann, are you, are you available to hop on? In, in case not, you know, just to replay that scene very quickly. So you've got, you know, here they come down the boat, right? You've got the, the, the down the canal, you've got the merchants on, on both sides. And there's this really humorous, what starts is a really humorous interaction with the chicken merchant, right? So here yes. he is, he's trying to give him a chicken, no, go away. But it quickly devolves into uh, something. And, and what really struck me was, I mean, we, we had already heard about Paul's PTSD and, you know, he's suffering and, and you know, throughout the course of his life. Um, but it went both ways, right? And there was a really visceral yes. reaction from the Vietnamese merchant as well. Would you like to comment on that, Kevin? Yeah, that's that's one of the things Spike's really great at, um, that, um, including the Vietnamese point of view. Uh, that uh, originally the way the way it was written was really more just about Paul's, you know, PTSD and his reaction to, you know, kind of getting into a frustrating situation. 
but it, but it, it, it you know, but uh, it's what Spikes does with like do the right thing and other movies, you know, showing the other point of view is, is key to really making those scenes work. And, um, uh, and you find out when they get into this argument, you know, that, that the merchant has got some bitter, angry feelings about, about the war as well. And he starts laying out stuff about you killed my, my mother, you killed my father, you know, and, and uh, so that, that was, that was always something that we were looking to always have underneath the surface in any opportunity we, we could find. Absolutely. And Sue Ann, feel free to jump in if you're able. We're, we're happy to have you. Lori, I think I saw your hand a minute ago, too, if you'd like to hop in and then maybe Sue, Sue Ann can come in. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. I really love this concept because of the International Relations Council, but having it through um, a work of art is fascinating. I enjoyed the two embedded links to criticisms of the work or just critical analysis of the work. And just one more comment. I appreciate the foreshadowing on the mind because um, I could sort of see that coming. So thank you, because I struggle with that in Vietnam sure. movies. Jeez. But um, this is just a film filming conceit, I guess, because I loved that the actors remained old in the flashbacks. There was the one still shot of them where they had been digitally. But did that did that influence how you wrote about them? Because to me, it added, if we're talking about layers here, it added so many layers to the characters for me. I love seeing them remain who they were in backwards, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, that was a choice that Spike made early on from the very beginning. That he was not going to uh, digitally make them young um, and or have younger actors play them in mm -hmm. and, um, scenes. Uh, and so when, and, and it was it was for artistic reasons and also practical reasons, you know, that that digital, you know, enhancing stuff is, is very expensive. And mm -hmm. so, there's that we would just add a lot of money to the budget of the film. Um, uh, and as well, you know, if we had used makeup in, in the 100 degree weather in, you know, tile, well, that's really, you know, tough too. So, um, so uh, when he made that choice, I really started trying to find uh, themes I could connect what kind of, what kind of um, comment can I make on war by, by, by applying this choice. And, and it made me think about how war never really never ends. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's several scenes that talk about that in various ways. There's a couple that, that, were, that were cut that, that talked about a little bit. Uh, but that, that I think is one of the main points of the film. And that, that, um, it, that war never ends in all kinds of different ways. I mean, the landmines. That never ends. The munitions that are around, the danger that never ends, the, the environment destruction never ends. I mean, nothing, when you when you go to war, it, it leaves a, a permanent thing in, in the lives of anybody it touches. And um, and, and that's that's just the nature of war. And uh, and I think the flashbacks really kind of work really great to bring that up, you know, which, you know, there's always a little fear of how that was going to work, but I, I'm not heard anybody that hasn't really liked that choice so i i hope it starts a trend because i don't i don't like all that cgi stuff especially in characters i thought it was beautiful and and did add something a lot so. thank you thank you so we're, we're coming to the end of our time so sue ann i would love for you to jump in and then dustin you will get the last question sir you've got a good one to close on so sue ann please um, mine is more a comment. Uh, as I wrote uh, in the chat, I'm of the age where I was in college. I was at Ohio University um, during the Vietnam War, uh, especially in the late 60s, early 70s in that part of the war. Um, we were, I was an activist and we helped close the university down, which I'm very proud of. Um, what was hard for me though, in one part was 
watching the film and really realizing how much anger I still have at the United States. And it probably, and the presidents, the people who were presidents during that time period, and it probably underlines um, my perspective on the world, <laughs> especially about the United States. I'll stop there. <laughs> Well, I, I uh, thank you, and thank you for your service as an activist, because I think people, people, um, that was a very difficult time, and it was people like you that helped in that madness, and thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I think that we see it today as, as much as you see it in the movie, that uh, people pay personal consequences of, of politicians that don't know what they're doing. And, and have and, and people that have horrible agendas and people that have personal agendas and people have corrupt agendas and 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 all of that was part of Vietnam uh, and and uh, and a lot of people's lives were destroyed because of that and uh, and that's that's I mean people you know talk about politics and stuff but but that's why politics matters because in the end, people's lives are affected and people's lives can be altered. I mean, I have a cousin that, that was never the same after he came back to Vietnam and, and kind of lived a sad, a sad life after that and, and died kind of in a horrible way because of it. And, uh, and that's just, he's just one of thousands and thousands of people, you know, in America and in Vietnam that were horribly affected by the war and, um, and you, know, you know, people will ask you when you make a film, well, why are you making this Vietnam movie now? I mean, why, why now? And, and to me, that's kind of a sad question because um, this is something that has shaped America. Yes. And it, shaped, it totally has shaped America. I mean, it, it affected us it politically, it affected us socially, it affected families, it affected every, and so, even asking the question of why now, I mean, it lets you know kind of how we think about how we think of movies and how and how movies you're supposed to only make movies that have something that go that's going on, you know, that's culturally really current right now, and it's just yeah. that's stupid. Uh, and and it's that kind of stuff that that I think um, you know makes us not really learn from our mistakes and not learn from our history. It makes us not learn from our past. I would just add that we as Americans have not treated the Vietnam vets very well at all. And that, again, it's like part of our problem as a country. Um, those people who did come back, and like you said, your cousin has not really recovered. Um, that's one of the outcomes of war. That's right. Thank you. Um, there is so much more that we could discuss. And uh, Kevin, I had about 10 other questions for you that we'll have to find another time to talk about. Uh, but Dustin, I would, I would love for you to close with, uh, with your question, please. Sure, Dr. Wilma. I like to ask people who are in the arts, like, what are their favorites in their area? So what are your five favorite films? Well, uh, that's always a tough one. You know, mo movies for, for filmmakers are like their kids. It's hard to it's hard to, you know, you know, it's hard to say what you, what kid you like most of <laughs> your kids, have five kids. So, so this is, this is kind of like that question for me. Anyway, um, you know, um, uh, probably some of my favorites are, um, and these are movies that probably had effects on me that, it, that I learned from that I go back and watch anytime they're on TV, I'll just start watching them. Um, Chinatown would be, probably be a, a big one. Um, I learned a lot about screenwriting from Chinatown. Um, uh, uh, one of my favorite films is um, a movie called Seven Beauties. It's an Italian film by Lena Wertmuller. She was the first woman director to be nominated for an Academy Award. Uh, it's called Seven Beauties, and uh, it's a really great film. I, and I learned a lot about um, satire and drama and combining satire and drama into one kind of, of uh, commentary that, uh, from that film and from her movies. Her movies are often about sex and, and politics and things like that. And, you know, um, uh, 
probably another one is uh, The Verdict with Paul Newman. Uh, at one point, I, I thought about becoming a lawyer, and I started watching that film <laughs> uh, uh, over and over again and, and just end up falling in love with it. It's, it's, I showed it in my screenwriting class. It's really constructed incredibly well and, um, uh, and you know, great direction, uh, obviously, by, uh, um, you know, I can't think of his name right now. But, uh, but anyway, that's, that's probably my third film. Uh, Doctor Strangelove, uh, for for the obvious reasons, but learn a lot from about satire of that film. Uh, how to be really serious and be funny at the same time. Um, and uh, and the last one, you know, I you know that the last one's tough because I mean, there's a lot of, you know, uh, I mean, I think Do the Right Thing is a really great film. Um, you know, I mean, there's so many. I have a lot of guilty pleasures. The the, the good and the bad and the ugly is uh, one of my favorite films. Um, I just, I mean, I fell in love with that movie as a kid and it really, it's the first movie that I, I thought of as a movie as a kid. And I, you know, I, I asked my mother for the, for the soundtrack album and she thought I was, my brother said, we knew you were weird when you asked for the soundtrack album for your birthday. So, <laughs> so th those would be my, fa my favorites. I Thanks. think amazing I think I, I think I saw some note takers uh, going there and Tamara thank you for putting that in the chat so everybody has the list uh, to go check out. Uh, we are at the end of our time. Uh, Kevin Wilmot, thank you so much uh, truly for uh, your insight for sharing this time with us. Um, I think all of us, Andrea Allison Putman says that she's going to go back and watch the film for a third time. Uh, I think all of us uh, could could watch uh, could watch it again. So Kevin, thank quiet. you. I appreciate it guys. Thank you.